Here we go. If we all can stand.
there's nothing good going on. And the enemy would like us to think, in, even on our own lives, to, to help us focus on the difficulties, the doubts, the troubles, and forget how faithful you've been to us, how you always are with us, and how you, you'd never forsake us. But Lord, we choose to focus on that and say, we know who we, we know who we have believed. We know, and we are convinced, persuaded, that you are going to finish all that you've begun in each one of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And so we give this time to you. We ask you just to receive our worship in praise, in music, in word, in hearing of the word, in responding, in preaching, and all of it, that in our hearts today we would choose to say, Lord, we are grateful, and because we're going to show you said if we love you, we're going to follow your commands. So we choose to focus on those today, God, to say, I want to know, Lord, what you're thinking. What are you wanting to accomplish in us today? Have your way and help us to cooperate, both to, that we would have your heart and want to do the things you want us to do and be willing to trust you to empower us to live the life you've called us to live. For you who have called us are faithful. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we truly are in amazement and awe that you are our God. And we just sung of your great gift to us. Yes, it's free. Yes, it's priceless, dear Lord, but it is also costly. Please forgive us when we take for granted the cost of your gift of love through your Son, Jesus Christ. That's why we're here this morning, to worship you, to bow down before you, to declare that you are our God. We just thank you for all that you've done for us, and be with us as we look at your word here this morning. We just pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I understand uh, Daniel and Marlene are here. Welcome. Welcome back to the United States. Good to see your smiling faces. So folks, after the service, feel free to go back and say hi to Daniel and Marlene. I think they're home on leave or sabbatical or whatever. So they will be around the area for uh, a number of weeks or so. So again, welcome. And I, they will be probably sharing with us in the future what was happening in Uruguay and their ministry. So again, welcome to us this morning, uh, from us this morning. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. It's, also, it's Father's Day, as we said, but it's also the first day of summer. I love it. When I always thought of summer, in fact, we were just talking about it, uh, about be school being out and being out for the, the summer. That was my favorite time of the year, leaving school, and we had summer to do what we wanted to do and whatever. It was just great. I warned those who are in school that that goes away once you become an adult. You have a, maybe a week's vacation, but not a whole summer. So for those who get summer vacation, enjoy it while it lasts. So again, first day of summer, the weather is cooperating with that as well. Well, again, it's good to be here this morning. Uh, we are continuing our studies on the book, uh, Believe. Um, for those of you who are sports fans like myself, we're at halftime. We are halfway through the book. So, I don't say it's all downhill from here, but we're halfway through the book, chapter-wise, and we're also halfway, the book is set up into three segments, and we're also now halfway today through the second segment, uh, which is entitled, What Should I Do? How do we live out what we believe as we've been talking about over the last number of months here? So it's halftime. Don't have a halftime show. We're just going to go from here forward. So we're halfway through looking at, in the second part, there are 10 focuses that we want to look, have been looking at or will be looking at of how we live out what we believe in our Christian lives, acting on our beliefs. If you recall, the, the first five we did in this section was focusing on our deepening our relationship with God. We talked about worship. We talked about prayer, Bible study, single-mindedness. Mind Last week, Jim, Pastor Jim talked about total surrender. Those were focused on our relationship with God, what I would call the vertical. You've heard me talk about this many times, about the vertical and the horizontal. Well, today we start the journey of the five focuses on the horizontal, the relationship between you and I because of our relationship with God. And so this morning we're going to start with the idea or the concept of biblical community. Biblical community. Now, my own mind works in weird ways sometimes, so when I hear a statement or a description of biblical community, to me, then, there, there must be the opposite, unbiblical community. 
our secular community. And so be it. That, I believe, is true. So what is the, the definition of community? I think we all have our own definition. So I went to the dictionary, of course, and this is the official definition. Definition of community, a unified body of individuals, such as, and then he gives some examples, uh, people with common interests living in a particular area. I'll say your hometown. We live in the Hopeland area, so our community where we live is Hopeland. So wherever you live, that your, your common interest in that you're living together, that's your local community. Another example would be a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together in a larger society. Focusing on characteristics or their own interests. Um, I would think of like the Lions Club locally or a motorcycle club or any type of club you'd be a part of. You have certain interests that bring you together in community. Another example would be a body of persons of common and especially professional interests scattered throughout the larger society. Doctors gather together, uh, lawyers, uh, I'm in the financial world, we have, there's associations you can be a part of. I remember my dad, he was a, a builder, a carpenter, he was part of the local building association here in Lancaster County. So there, there's interest in what we do and our professions and maybe our education level that brings us together as a community. Another example would be a body of persons or nations having a common history, or common social, economic, and political interest. And I thought of this past week, I think it was the, what we call the G7. Seven countries that have similar backgrounds as far as economic and those types of things. They just met, uh, I think it was this week or the week before, it's called the G7. So these are what I would call examples of community. Not necessarily biblical, it's not what brings them together. Uh, like I said, the Lions Club, we think of the Masons, uh, the local fire company, volunteer fire company, would be a community that brings people together for the reason of fighting fires and protecting the community. In a loose kind of way, sometimes we think of the local bar or tavern as a gathering place for folks who come together as a community to share their victories and many times their struggles. So this idea of community is not an unheard of or new idea to the world around us. Community is something that we see all around us. You see, the world, in fact, wants community, needs to be in community. Why? Because God created us, designed us that way. He designed us and he hardwired human beings, you and I, to desire community, to be together, whatever it might be that brings us together. And so this morning, we're going to look at what it means or the description of biblical community. What does it mean to be in biblical community or do community from a biblical perspective? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. You see, biblical community is essential to the Christian life, and a vital aspect to the church. As we engage in the new family that is under now God's leadership, we not only achieve God's purpose in our lives, or the lives of others, or the world, but it also reinforces our belief, our belief in God and his church. So my question for us this morning is this. How do we develop a healthy relationship with one another, with others? That is community. How do we do this? The key idea, I believe, behind this idea of biblical community is that we fellowship with Christians, with one another, believers in Christ, to accomplish God's purposes 
in our lives and in the lives of others and those in the world. Living the Christian life is not for the lone ranger. It's not for the person who wants to be in solitary all their lives. Now, there's times where we need to maybe pull away in solitude. There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus did it many times, and we're called to that. But we don't stay there. And so to be a part of a biblical community, you can't be a lone ranger because you can't have community by yourself. We do not live our faith out by ourselves, but in concert with others, with other believers. This, again, like I said, is how God created us. He created us to be with others, to be in relationship, to be in community. Again, God designed us and hardwired us for community. And this biblical community that I mentioned earlier and we were talking about is both the vertical and the horizontal between God and us and each other. Many times we'll focus on one or the other. For the Lone Ranger, if you will, who likes a lot of solitary, will focus on their relationship with God and themselves vertically. Again, important. Primary, if you will. And then there's some who will just focus on others. And maybe that's the definition of what I was talking about earlier, the secular, where you're, you're focused on one another, but there's nothing connecting you to, to God. And so as we look at this biblical idea of community, the two aspects have to be present, the vertical and the horizontal. Yes, God created us for community. Go back to the creation. In the garden, Adam was created for community with God. In fact, God was so um, made, it, made sure that this was going to happen that he even set up some parameters within the garden. He created the garden, placed Adam, and then created Eve and placed Eve and set up the parameters that, hey, you can eat anything in this garden of any of these trees except for the one tree of uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So anything they did not have to do to protect this community that God is creating. Now we know what happens and we're not going that direction of the choice they made to turn, but what I'm trying to show us is God created us f- for community as he showed here in creation. He also created Adam and Eve for companionship to have at the human level as well so that we're not alone and we're not by ourselves when it comes to walking out our faith in Christ. So you see, this idea of community is not something nice to have. It's not an afterthought or, oh, by the way, maybe we should do community as something we might like to do. No, I would surmise and I would say that community is essential. It is essential in our lives, in living out godly lives, in living out healthy lives for God. You see, God, like I said, has intended for humans to have rich, life-giving relationships with each other, relationships that energize and motivate us, or are motivated by the presence of God among us. The presence of God among us. That's what we unite around. And in order to sustain this life-giving biblical community, like I said, God must be at the center of it. God must be at the center of our community, our biblical community. Our text this morning is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, We'll be looking at verses 44 and 47. But before we talk about those verses, let's just back up a little bit and see what was happening and how we got to these verses. Now, Jim preached his first sermon as an introduction to us here 
back on May the 9th, I guess it was, or a couple weeks ago, from this exact same text. So what you might hear, you might have heard before, but we're not going to go down the same road, but you might hear some of the things that we, uh, Jim might have said that I might have said. But Janet keeps track in her Bible of sermons preached from texts. She'll put the name and the date. And under this, we have five sermons within the last 10 years or so. One by today, Jim, Peter preached from it. Um, Grant Game had preached from it. So there's a few that... We've heard this before, so what we're about to look at is not new, but maybe in a new perspective, because I always contend, and I've said this before, God's Word is living. The truth never changes. What is written never changes, but what does change is us and our situation and our journey. Where I'm at today in looking at this text is different than what I was even back when Jim preached from it six weeks ago. Or 10 years ago when I heard it preached one other time. That's the beauty of the living word. So that's what we're looking at this morning. Um, Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 47. But what these verses are doing is describing something. It's a descriptive. It's a description that we find in Scripture. Just kind of a sidebar here. Um, when you look at Scripture, there's mainly two different types of Scriptures. You have descriptive, which talks about what has happened. And there's also what we call prescriptive, which says, this is what you do, the Ten Commandments. And we'll look at, as an example, we'll look at some Scripture today. That's where I want to head the prescriptive behind the descriptive this morning. It's like going to the doctor and he prescribed you Medication. That's prescription. How you fill that med medication by the pharmacy you go to or however you do it, that's descriptive. And so that's what we're seeing here this morning. We're seeing a descriptive uh, description of what has happened from a prescription earlier from, from the Lord. So as we back up and look at Acts chapter 2, we, we're very familiar with what's happening. The, Jesus has returned back to heaven, He's ascended. He's promised the disciples and the followers, hey, I'm going back to my Father, but I will give to you the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, we see now the description of what has happened. They are gathered together. The Holy Spirit comes, and it just shakes everything up. You think about it, they were in community before this. Okay, community is not something new. The children of Israel in community, they were in community, but what's happening here in chapter 2 of Acts is a dynamic change, an infusion of power to the community. And we see in today's text what happens because of that infusion of the Holy Spirit. We see Peter then getting up and dressing the crowd. Peter at his finest, just giving a great message. And out of that, people respond because they see what has happened. And people are coming to faith. It says that one day over 3,000 came to faith. Then starting in verse 42 in my Bible, it describes it the fellowship of believers, or I'm going to say the community of believers, which leads us into today's text. So let me just read the text for today from Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 47. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Beautiful, beautiful scripture. The one caution I have as we look at this text, because it is descriptive, is I don't believe 
this scripture is telling us to do verbatim exactly how they did community. It says they sold property, possessions to give as people needed. They met in the temple courts every day. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. It was describing what was leading them to do that. And that's what we want to look at today, the, the, the prescription behind the description. What we've got to be careful of is when we look at a descriptive verse like this, is oh, we need to do this, and thus, this is the formula. We just plug ourselves into the situation. And many times when we do that, we will falter because it's not based on why it was done. It's based on how it was done. That's many times where we get into legalism and religion. Taking a descriptive verse and say, okay, that's how we do it, and we make it a formula. What we want to look at this morning is what's behind their reaction and why they did what they did. Beautiful text, encouraging text, is an example to help us also. How do we then live out here in Ephrata, in 2021, the same spirit that we see here in the text. That's our challenge. That's where we need to go. As we look at the text, we seek Acts chapter 2, there's one marked difference between the church and the rest of society, as I talked about in community. And it is the call to live with others. Throughout the, old, I'm sorry, throughout the New Testament, Jesus' followers were urged to look to one another, to help one another. And when the early Christians did this in faith, its irresistibility attracted outsiders to belong to the family of God. The practice of looking out for one another is the hallmark of true biblical community. If we want to increase our numbers, we don't need a glitzy marketing campaign. We don't need an awesome building, although we have that. We don't need an awesome preacher. We don't need an awesome worship team, if it's focused on that. What we need is community and love for one another. And we'll talk about this near the end. The multiplication comes out of that. So Jesus encouraged us to love one another. In fact, one of the verses that we so often talk about is the greatest commandment when Jesus had that interaction. And how did Jesus respond about keeping the commandments? In Mark 12, 31, or 30 and 31, he says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your mind and all your strength. The vertical. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There, there are no commandments greater than these, vertical, horizontal. That's Jesus telling his followers and us today, this is what he's calling us to do. This is what's behind the description here in Acts 2. Later, we see Jesus in Matthew describing the great judgment seat. And he uses the illustration of a king making judgment, and he divides the people in front of him to sheep and goats. The, sheeps, the sheep were the ones who fulfilled what the king wanted. The goats, not so much. And out of that description, we can also see where Jesus was kind of in, saying, hey, this is my prescription, if you will, of how to love one another. Let me re just read briefly uh, from Matthew 25, 34 to 36. He's using this as an an illustration, he said, Then the king will say to those on the right, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Now listen, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, 
You clothed me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I would believe that the church in Acts 2 knew these scriptures were in the back of their mind. If somebody's hungry, I need to feed them. If somebody's thirsty, I need to feed them. Well, in my case, the only way I can do is I need to sell some property here so I can buy the food and give it to them. You see what's happening here in Acts chapter 2? Following what Jesus was asking them to do. Paul also, in the writing to the churches in, in the New Testament, also gave this prescription, if you will, of how we are to do biblical community. Let me just read through a number of these, all familiar, but just a reminder again of why we do what we do as community within the church. Romans 12, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Sound familiar? Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt uh, to love one another. For whoever loves others will fulfill the law. Can we see that when Jesus asked about the greatest commands? Loving one another fulfills that law. Galatians 5, 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. There's that word again, love. You catching the theme here, the focus? Galatians 6.2, carry each other's burden, and in thus, in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Again, the law of Christ. But how do we fulfill it? Caring for each other. Ephesians 4, 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. It just struck me here, the word patience and bearing with one another in love. Sometimes, I'm sure for you to love me, you have to be very patient. And the converse is true for me as well. It's what it is. But I like this. Be patient, bearing one another in love. And finally, Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So why do we do this? Not just for our own feel good. Hey, it feels good for me. It's to show our reverence to Christ. The calling among the early church to care for one another was also demonstrated in one way. And we talked about, I think Jim talked about this as well, simple hospitality. Remember when I talked about in Matthew, where I read about, um, I was a stranger, he invited me in. That sounds like hospitality to me. The mandate to show love and demonstrate an open door policy greatly enhanced the quality of community and always left room for a few people, for new people, not few, new people to belong, regardless of their station or their situation in life. This is some new things that was coming to fruition. This act of hospitality, simple hospitality. You see, the act of hospitality practiced by the early Christians it broke down social and ethnic barriers in powerful ways. In our world today, it seems that hospitality is often limited to hosting parties and events for people who look and act like us. We usually practice hospitality with people who share our social and ethnic Backgrounds. Nothing wrong with that, but if that's our limitations, hmm. Especially, this is interesting, especially practicing it with those who can pay us back in time. But the church expanded when the, such barriers were no longer obstacles to call, to the call to become intimate 
as one family, practicing new life together in radical ways. As I was looking, talking about this idea of inviting those who then can invite us, I think it comes out of our culture. We have a scorecard. If I am invited somewhere else, well, we need to invite them back. And then if we're in, we invite them, then they have to back and forth. So we keep a scorecard of our hospitality. I don't think that's hospitality. I think that's entertainment. We talk about, Allison has a beauty, had given a beautiful talk on that a number of years ago. We were at, up at their church, the difference between entertainment and hospitality. And I'm not going to go into that, but... If what we're doing is to keep track of who we've had and are they going to have us back or do we think the same? Are we in the same economic stratus? Are we the same background ethically? Whatever. We need to expand that. And that's what was happening here in the early church. It was expanding it. And that's what caught the attention of those around them. Oh, you mean I don't have to have a certain last name? Oh, you mean I don't have to have a certain level of income or education? Oh, I don't have to live in a certain area to be included into your community. Just like today, back then, it, community was stratified. And this was new for the community, and that's what drew the people in. the new and radical ways that they were say, seeing. So my question for us this morning is, how do we do that in the situation we are in, showing that simple hospitality? As I was reading through the text, it was the last part of the verse that I think grabbed me this time in a new way. And maybe this is just me, but my hunch is it's not. I think it's something we deal with in our culture and maybe even struggle with. Let me just read the very last sentence of the, the, um, the verse or the section here. It said, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The thought that came to me is, Jeff, you're not responsible for the increase in the kingdom of God. You're not responsible for the reaction or people coming through our doors or accepting Christ or whatever that might be. That is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to show hospitality and love. And as people receive that and see that, it's like, whoa, there's something greater beyond us. And so I think personally too many times I've focused on, oh, we need to increase our numbers. We need to grow this church leaps and bounds. The only way we know we are successful is if we have 500 people in the sanctuary. Now that's great and that, that may happen. But if it, we're depending on ourselves, here's the breaking news, it won't. It's up to the Lord. What we need to do is be obedient to what he is calling us to do. And if we do that, we become this sweet aroma as we read, and people are going to go, wow, what's happening there? I like that. Draws them in, and they come. So for us, let's just take that yoke of burden off us that we have to manage and control and increase physical numbers of who is coming to us and being a part of this. Because many times we might not know in our association with somebody within the community, they might end up with another fellowship or community. And that's fine. That's what we're talking about. When we say growing the church, it's the church universal not a live church effort of. So if our focus is more on doing community and helping those in need and 
connecting and having that relationship, I believe, no, I know we will, it will grow because it comes from the Lord. I've always said in meetings that anytime, this is how I am, if I sense you're coming to me and being nice as a marketing ploy to become a part of our program, I'm out of here. And so what we need to be sure of is that we're not looking at people as, oh, a way to increase our numbers. Because as soon as we, they have a sense that we are trying to market them to be a part of us, we're done. I think what we need to do, and I believe we have and we will continue, but we need to continue to grow it as being in community. You see, we have been created by God for community, as I said earlier. Now, given our sinful nature, it is essential for God to be at the center of our community, as I just said. He was in the garden with Adam and Eve. He dwelt in the tabernacle in the temple with Israel. He literally walked among his, with his first disciples for 30 years while he was here on earth. And from the inception of the church until now, since Acts 2 to now, God has dwelt, not in temples built by human hands, as the scripture says, but in a new temple, the lives of his followers. We are the temple, each one of us. So folks, the Lord is here today because we are here today. He's dwelling within us. God's presence is here. As we yield to the presence of God's spirit in and among us, we grow in true biblical community, marked by caring for one another and with open hospitality as we spoke about. As we fellowship with other Christians, it has not only become the rich experience that we were created for, but as I said earlier, it admits this, admits this aroma that draws others in. So, we must make biblical community a priority in order to accomplish God's purpose in our lives, in the lives of others and the world around us. You see, God's word places a high value on Christian fellowship. We just read through those in scripture. So my question for us this morning is, how important is fellowship or community to us right now? Is it important? And so what difference, what is the difference that it is making in our lives today? Shall we pray? Gracious Father, again, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a God of community, that you created us to be in community with you, but not only you, but with one another. And we pray that our focus of our community here as biblical community is upon you first, and then upon others, dear Lord. May our love for one another and for others be a, this fresh worm, as we talked about, that will draw people to you. And forgive us those times when we have run ahead of you and tried to do what is only your responsibility in drawing people and adding to our numbers, dear Lord. We want to leave that in your hands. We want to be obedient to what you have called us. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
meditate on what we just heard, an important question about community and fellowship. Let us sing of God's creation and how we will praise him. Let us stand as we sing this song. Don't speak. 
chased out my heart through all of my failure and pride. On the hill you created the light of the world, the abandoned in darkness to that song thank you for playing doing that one for us today and what a awesome message through a reminder of all that God has done for us and as we heard today we're to live that message Jesus said they'll know you're my disciples how by your love one for another so let's ask the Lord to help us even this week how can we each live out that sense of Christian community that shows the love of Christ and draws people do it so will I Lord thank you thank you for your word in music and preaching and prayer and everything today and thank you Lord that you don't call us to do what we can't we can love one another but first we need as was said today we need to get right with you and have you working in our hearts that's where the love has to come from the love of God overflowing in our hearts we can't manufacture it we don't want to fake it we want the real thing and you died so that we could God we pray that you'll do whatever is necessary to conform us into the image of your son and to make us those irresistible drawing cards of yours to bring people to Jesus to salvation to true life so be with us and go with your people today and by your spirit work in each one of us cause us to take time to think to pray to seek you to know you better and to allow you to live through us more fully in jesus name amen amen god bless you